Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. Welcome. Well, you've been here for a while. Dick and I were just commenting on the fact that we were in the unenviable position of following a concert violinist, Annie Lennox, and the most courageous person in the country. So no. please be gentle. Yes. <laughs> I felt uh, like I should at least bring a flute out or something and, you know, yeah. as an accompaniment. Anyway, let's start with a, a general question, Dick, because I think we're, we're appealing to a crowd that's both high-tech and low-tech and medium-tech, and I'd put myself in that last, last uh, category. But if a Martian landed here in Aspen and said, before I abduct you, I want to ask you one question, what the heck is this Twitter thing? What would you tell him or her? I think if it was prefaced with before I abduct you, I might not stick around to answer the question, but <laughs> assuming that I had the nerves to do so, um, we think of, you know, it's, it's actually a very funny question because it took us a while as a company to answer that um, because it is used in so many different ways by so many different people. But what we finally came to realize is that the characteristics of it being public and real time and conversational led us to conclude that it's this global town square, um, much like the town squares of old, that anyone can walk into and see around them what's going on and what people are talking about. And it's all very much like a town square, very raw, unfiltered. It's inside out, meaning you're hearing the news and the experiences from the people it's happening to. And it's multi-directional. It's not being broadcast at you. You're participating in it. So that's the way we think of it. That's the way we describe it. It's this global town square. And once you sort of arrive at that notion of describing it that way, uh, it's fascinating to see how often that's reinforced. What did you? Was there a tipping point when you realized that, gosh, we've really made it? Was it when, for example, the Pope started tweeting and the Vatican announced that he was retweeted more times than Justin Bieber? Uh, or was it when Hillary joined recently and her profile, Dick and I were actually looking at it backstage because it was so funny, her profile is wife, mom, lawyer, woman, uh, women and kids advocate, U.S. Senator, Secretary of State, author, dog owner, hair icon, pantsuit aficionado, glass ceiling cracker, uh, cracker, and then TBD, dot, dot, dot. But, but was there this moment where you thought, you know, this has gone from this sort of fun platform to, to a tremendous cultural force? Well, it, the funny thing is it keeps happening. Um, you know, there were certainly uh, lots of events around the Arab Awakening where uh, uh, during the protests in Tunisia where people were using platforms like Twitter to organize protests, and then uh, that continued, uh, sort of swept across uh, North Africa. Um, so there was certainly that moment. And then there was, the, uh, of course, the as you mentioned, the, uh, it's sort of funny internally when the, when the Pope joined Twitter, the woman who was um, working with that, the team uh, in, in, in the Vatican on that, sent me a note and said, hey, just, you know, I want to give you a heads up. I'm onboarding the Pope. And I thought it was like some cool band I hadn't heard of <laughs> at first. I, because she works on that, that team. And uh, she, you know, and we had this sort of quick email exchange. She's like, no, the Pope, you know. And uh, so th that was another one of those remarkable moments. And they just keep happening. You know, Warren Buffett just uh, joined the platform. And then he welcomed Hillary. I think that the the moments that are truly fascinating for us inside the company are when you see these artificial barriers to communication that have existed for centuries, barriers of status, barriers of socioeconomic status, barriers of celebrity, when they're completely ripped apart, right? And so you'll see these amazing exchanges like the Canadian hip hop artist Drake uh, sending out this boastful tweet that says, you know, the first million is the hardest. And then a uh, Texas oil tycoon, T. Boone Pickens, replying, the first billion's a hell of a lot harder, you know? <laughs> and those are conversations you never saw before, right? right. And so it's fascinating and to observe And we all can them. eavesdrop. Yeah, that's right, and we all, we all get to see them now. So those are fascinating conversations. And speaking of eavesdropping, let's talk about the NSA, because the agency, of right course, into, I that walked was, right thank you into for that, that segue. Yeah. Thank you. The agency, of course, has disclosed the existence of this program called PRISM, which allows the government to gain access to the private communications of users of nine popular internet s services. What is your position on this, Dick, and how has Twitter been able to stay above the fray? No, I think in the, when you refer to stay above the fray, I think you're referring to the, in, in the reports. Not being named. In the reports, we, we, we weren't one of the nine that was listed. Um, I think what I'll say about that is we have a very, uh, we have taken inside the company a very public, um, principled approach to the way we deal with requests for user information. Um, it was uh, widely publicized during the WikiLeaks case 
that we argued uh, with a, uh, a court order to be able to tell the users whose information was being requested um, that their information was being requested so that they could, uh, they could fight that request if they so wished, and we won that, uh, we won that, uh, uh, that pushback that we gave. Of course, we have to operate, uh, we have to obey the rule of law in the countries in which we operate. So when we receive a valid legal request, a very specific valid legal request, uh, we comply with it just like uh, any other company uh, uh, has to. When we receive what we perceive to be broad um, requests that don't particularly um, adhere to some specific valid legal request, we push back on those. Um, and I guess you know, that's about, about as much as I can say about Did anyone it, about from the government approach you or anyone at your company and ask for access to users' uh, you know, information, private information? Yeah, so I, I'll go back to the way I just answered it and say when we receive overly, what we perceive to be broad uh, requests for information, we push back on those, but we do, uh, uh, we do, you know, comply with specific valid legal requests. So did you push back? Did the government ask and did you push? <laughs> We're probably done. We're probably done with this line okay. of questioning. <laughs> So do you, do you think, despite their denials, that any of the... That would be a good the... time to ask the IPO question, by the way, because they're all sort of, it's this, you know, we can be done with all those lines of questioning. Okay, well, do you want me to, let me ask you about the oh, IPO. Just, okay. <laughs> tell us what you can tell us. There's speculation that you will go public later this year, early next year. What can you tell us about that, Dick? As I said, now would be a good time to ask me the IPO question, because I never comment on those things. Can you comment at all, though? Because I have some good follow-ups. When May, Twitter was valued at $10 billion. I guess coming in at that valuation, how are your IPO investors likely to fare? It's good. You're like a, a trying to attack the castle from the side now, and then we'll, then we'll try the back door, et cetera. I, you know, I don't, I'll tell you the, the way I think about this specifically. I don't try to get caught up in the short term um, thinking about the company and about, in any respect, in terms of the product, in terms of where we're taking the product, in terms of um, reacting to other things that are happening in the market, in terms of the value of the company. We have a very specific point on the horizon that we're trying to guide the company toward this notion of this global town square. Um, it is, it applies to Twitter, it applies to the, our video product Vine, and we all internally think about the things we want to achieve in order to get us there, and they will work and be successful on their own merits, not in reaction to any third party value of the company or anything along the product lines that another company does. I just don't, I try to keep people inside the company focused on goals, not competitors, but, but you could replace competitors with any sort of external force. You have to observe what's going on in the landscape, but then be smart about where you're trying to take the company yourself. Did you all learn anything from the Facebook IPO? I think that I think that my answer to that question again is you know you can, I think you can get um, I think companies and individuals be, can become obsessed with what the rest of the market is talking about. You know, Warren Buffett talks frequently about the fact of the benefit of being in Omaha is that he's not you know hearing all the sort of in, uh, inside baseball conversation about what's going on in the market, and that allows him to have sort of calm, thoughtful uh, analysis of what, what he wants to do. And we think about Twitter the same way and don't really pay too much attention to what everyone else is chattering about in other companies. But uh, how important is making money for Twitter and, and being profitable, though? And, and no, seriously, what is the business plan for, for Twitter, and how do you hope to, to actually make money from all the different things that you're doing. Yeah, well, our revenue is, uh, you know, the business is, is growing quite well. I'm v extremely pleased with the way the, the business is growing. Um, uh, I'll tell you, I talk internally about it this way. Um, we think of revenue like oxygen, right? It's necessary for life. It's vital to the health and success of the business, but it's not the purpose of life. You don't get up in the morning and think, I've got to get enough oxygen today, right? So, of course, obviously, in managing a business, I'm thoughtful about our operating expenses and how they're growing 
growing in relation to revenue and what the you know quarterly growth in revenue looks like and do we have a good sense of quarterly predictability about revenue all those sorts of things you would want to manage well in a well-run business but I don't focus on those as the purpose of what we're trying to do we focus on solving user problems and creating beautiful user experiences knowing that the revenue will, will flow from that if we're smart about the way we're building the business let's talk about some of those user experiences you have a new video service called vine which is a six second loop tell me why you developed that product and and why six seconds yeah so uh, great I, I love talking about vine and I could talk about it for hours um, finally so we have something he'll talk about <laughs> so uh, so Vine was actually created by these three uh, fellows in, in New York who were out raising money for the product, and one of their initial investors introduced them to Jack Dorsey, the, uh, one of the co-founders of Twitter. And Jack called me when he saw it and said, you have to see these guys before they go back to New York. They had not launched the, the product yet. It was in the very early stages of developing it. I saw it that day. Uh, we bought, we acquired the company, changed the product a bit with those with those folks in New York, and launched it. It is, as you just mentioned, it's a six-second, very short videos. They loop, so it just keeps playing over and over and over. And when you sort of scroll through your Vine feed, um, they auto play. You don't have to hit a play button. They just sort of start playing as they come into view. And it's audio and video. The beauty of Vine, when Jack and I saw it that day, that those guys guys had created we thought was that like Twitter where you have the 140 characters that the six seconds would create this entirely new artistic language and and that super tight constraint would mean that would people would have to be creative in all sorts of new ways that they hadn't had to be creative before when they thought about freeform video. And indeed, that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing people develop this amazing language within that six second video constraint that's just as beautiful and organic as the 140 character language that you know is the was the genesis of hashtags and there are 13 million users or something like it's that it's growing now? remarkably well i mean i've said publicly before and i'll say it again better than we could have ever hoped and so uh we're just delighted with the success of that those guys um are you know they're in their own space in new york i want them building this and thinking about it organically in the context of what they've done for video and not um encumbered by, for example, um, well, we have to go monetize that right now. I'm just not worried about that at all. I'm letting them run with this amazing thing they've developed, and I think we'll leave it alone for quite some time. Because Instagram has now launched its own video service, right? Are yeah. you concerned about that? Uh, you know, I'll go, back to, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Those guys <laughs> launched these, uh, um, their 15-second videos. Um, I can't worry about, and I don't like to think about, reacting to what other people do in the market. Um, I think that's a bad, I think that's a failure of strategy. If you're running your business based on, look what those guys did, right? It's like driving by looking in the rear view mirror. That guy behind me just changed lanes. Maybe I should change lanes. Um, and, then, and then the other thing about it is if you're running your business that way, the people who work for you, it's not fun. It's not particularly exciting to think about, wait a minute, those guys did that. We have to go do that. That's not a fun place to go to work in the morning. It's not particularly creative. And it's not particularly courageous. So I want the product people that work for me on Twitter, on Vine, on Twitter music, on all the sorts of things we create to be thinking, you know, I, I recently stood in front of the design team at Twitter and said, until you guys bring something to me that I say, that's crazy, we would never do that, you're not being courageous enough, right? So I want to see more courage in the product designs. And I think that that's a fun place to work, not a go do what that thing what did. What other things are you excited about, Dick, that you guys are venturing into? You've got, as you mentioned, Twitter Music. You have something called Amplify. I know that you're looking into ways to to use to streamline more video and and do. Well, I mean, what's what's exciting to you on the horizon? So I think the combination of you know when I talk about the the global town square. One of the things we've observed is that when events occur in the world, whether they're um, planned events like the Super Bowl um, or unplanned events like the earthquake and ensuing tsunami in Fukushima, Japan, people flock to Twitter to talk about them. 
Um, in fact, for televised planned events, it's certainly the case that Twitter has become the social soundtrack for those events. Um, we will see for any type of, of program, again, from anything as big as the Super Bowl to something like a first-run episode of a Pretty Little Liars, that the moment the show starts, in fact, leading up to the show starting, there's a dramatic increase in the volume of tweets about that program that lasts for the entirety of the program, and in fact, you can track the spikes in interest during the program, like the, out the, uh, you know, the electric outage in the Super Bowl, or a touchdown in the Super Bowl, or a moment in Game of Thrones, or Pretty Little Liars where the conversation spikes on or Twitter. Or Wendy Davis and her filibuster. Yeah, that's right. That was the number one. That was the number one. Yeah. We should have Wendy Davis come here. Actually, that's a great, that's a great example, right? There was a, there was a, a, um, a state issue uh, that organically became the number one trend on Twitter that night. And if you saw it, you became riveted to the conversation about it, this sort of organic, this organic upswell of conversation about it. So the work we need to do in bringing that Twitter as the second screen for what people are seeing and observing and talking about in the world uh, into the conversation and tying those things together is there's an extraordinary amount of work we need to do there, and that's something I'm super excited about. Yeah, and I want to talk to you about how that affects both advertising and news. I know that you guys are going to take advantage of this second screen. I don't know, by the way, what is considered the second screen anymore, but people yeah. discussing what they're watching on TV yeah, they're online. Yeah, sort of coming together. Um, and by, by actually sending ads to some of those people who are talking about shows or watching particular programs, is that a slippery slope? Dick, do you worry about alienating some of the people who are going on Twitter precisely for, for the reason that they're not encumbered by a constant onslaught of advertisements? Um, so I don't worry about that because oh, the way our ad platform works is people can dismiss ads. So we have a very strong signal for people feeling like I'm starting to see too many ads or I'm starting to see ads I don't like. Uh, you can just sort of say I want this to go away. Um, and so we use that feedback to help us understand whether people feel like these are too intrusive or not. Um, the beauty of Twitter as the second screen will st for, for advertisers and for broadcasters is starting to mean that we can do things like, you know, the moment LeBron blocks the San Antonio Spurs player that was right at the rim trying to dunk, they can cut a 10 second instant replay of that, tweet it out, and people see that and think, oh, I've got to go tune into the game. So the tweet goes out as a 140 character caption, and there's a sort of a canvas of this 10 second video of LeBron who just blocked this guy's shot seconds ago that goes out, and people can see that wherever they are and rush to the TV and start watching if they want to. That's a great opportunity for marketers who can start to embed, you know, two little two-second pre-rolls into these 10-second instant replays, and that we're doing that, and those work great. And it's a great opportunity for the broadcaster to think of Twitter as a way of amplifying what they're already what they're already broadcasting. So you monetize that by charging yes. the the networks That's or whatever. Well, we monetize that by uh, doing things like revenue shares with the, with the broadcasters around the advertiser that they bring to the instant replay. We'll start to do that for pre-recorded shows where they'll be able to show a little 10 second, like this is coming up in the next five minutes on this pre-recorded show and have a two second pre-roll there. So there's, I think the, the cool thing about Twitter in this respect is it has traditionally been the case that, um, that technology companies and media companies uh, and traditional media companies have thought of each other as competitors. And technology companies come in and they're, they're viewed as disruptors of whatever the uh, traditional media vector is. And we think of ourselves much more as complementary to what these people are trying to do. And and think frequently about what are the kinds of things we can do to make their stuff better because that will empower us more and make us a better company. And how can we give you content? Right, that's, and, that's, and that's what we're seeing with the things like this Amplify, right? We're driving, we think we're driving tune into these programs, that's great. It's found money in the marketing department because they're now getting distribution of additional micro pieces of content that we're helping monetize on our network. It's great for the user because they're interested, you know, they're seeing this LeBron James block because they're following the NBA because they're interested in basketball. They get notified about it and know they need to go tune in. That's all good for everybody. What do you? What about the the? 
beef ab against Twitter is that it, it values immediacy over accuracy. And this sort of gets into the whole news arena, Dick. When somebody hacks into the AP's Twitter account and then announced that President Obama has been injured at the White House, and then that goes viral and retweeted 4,000 times, and it, it ostensibly, according to the Financial Times, affects the stock market, or someone tweets something that is totally inflammatory and false, and it maybe ruins someone's reputation or damages them uh, professionally. What do you do about that kind of information, misinformation, that gets po you know, put on Twitter and then goes viral on, on Twitter itself? Yeah, so there are, there are like three or four questions there, but I'll, I'll okay. dive into all of them. Okay. Um, so we don't, we don't have that much time. No, so. it's, no I'll, I'll, I'm speaking about as quickly as I can speak, but I'll ratchet it up a notch. Uh, I so, told him he should answer in 140 words. <laughs> so <laughs> the, fa the, fa the fascinating thing about Twitter is the very thing that em emboldens political speech in countries in which political speech is oppressed is the fact that you can come to Twitter with a pseudonym. So it, for example, in Tunisia, one of the protest organizers has a Twitter account and his handle is at Slim404. It's not his real name and address and everything else. And that's great in countries where political speech is, is, is oppressed because this person is able to come in there and, and boldly talk about organizing these protests. Of course, the flip side to that coin is people can hide behind anonymity when they're you know, shouting uh, obscenities at, at whoever they're shouting obscenities at. So, that is really a ranking problem for us. We need to do a much better job in our conversation tab uh, where, you're, where you see the, the information of the people you follow and the information of the people who are talking to you, tweeting to you. We need to do a much better job there of filtering out the noise, the sort of the, the hateful comments from the people who are just repeatedly saying the same things to you over and over and over again. On the, a, on the Associated Press front, We've recently launched a two-factor authentication uh, capability. Two-factor authentication very, very quickly is you don't just enter a password anymore, but you have to enter information from something you have, like your phone. So we'll send a, uh, a code to the phone that you also have to enter. So just knowing the password doesn't get you into the account if the account is, is hacked. Um, and we're working very closely with a variety of media companies to make sure they're using all the latest security uh, prevention mechanisms so that their accounts don't get hacked. But how do you be do a better job without being accused of censorship, Dick? You know, like, when do you decide what is acceptable speech, what is unacceptable, what is hate speech, what is free speech? I mean, that's a real conundrum, and who sits in judgment of all those things? Well, I think the thing that we, we need to do is be offer um, users themselves the tools to make those decisions for well, themselves. Well, I block a lot of people. So one of the things, for example, that we, need to f that we need to fix, I think, is the way block works. Today, when you block someone, they see that you've blocked them, right? That, frankly, I think is broken. And they sometimes use it sort of as a badge of honor. Yeah, like, oh, Katie Couric blocked me, right? Yeah. And then, then they, and that, that becomes, they you know, yell, yell more about it, and then their friends yell about it. So that's broken, frankly. You shouldn't see when somebody blocks you. It should be something that you, the user, are controlling, and not everyone else is seeing about how you're controlling your conversation. You might want to say, look, I only want to see replies from people, you know, I'm following right now. We need to give users those dials instead of making it a one-size-fits-all, and that's something we're working on. What are some of the ways that teenagers, I, I know you have a 14-year-old daughter, I have a 17-year-old daughter who loves Vine, by the way, I was telling Dick, she follows some, I think, French guy named Jerome Jarret Gira, or something like that. I mean, there, it's sort of, and she says he's incredibly artistic, but how are you noticing your daughter using social media, using technology, that makes you think about what's ahead rather than what people are doing in your rearview mirror? Yeah, well, it's certainly the case that my daughter and all of her friends are very, very comfortable uh, jumping in and out of different applications. They are absolutely not of the opinion that I want a one-size-fits-all app that I'll go to where, you know, everybody is and I do everything there. They hop in and out of Snapchat and Twitter and, you know, on and on and on, and they've got n number of apps on their phone, so I think that that will continue to be the case 
it's very easy for them to hop back and forth between things. And I don't think the notion of um, consolidation means anything to, to, to teens. They don't care about consolidation. They're happy to bounce back and forth between these things. Do you ever worry this peripatetic sort of behavior and this the way people are consuming information is contributing to a lack of, of depth and substance and kind of a very superficial knowledge and understanding of the world around us? No. And uh, so... <laughs> um, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Like, you know, so I'll, I'll sometimes get asked, you know, don't you feel that the 140 characters has meant that just people don't think deeply about things anymore and they just, they only say five, five words and then they move on to the next thing. The, you know, the reality is that you don't look at haiku and say, you know, aren't you worried that this, this format is going to prevent people from thinking deeply when you can only use this many words and it has to be set this way. I think that People develop language for creatively communicating within whichever, whatever kind of constraints you set for people. Um, you know, I go back to the, frankly, the beauty of the language that Twitter has created, right? Um, uh, one of, this woman who works for me told me she was in a, a gift store in an airport a couple months ago, and a girl walked up to her dad and said, hey, dad, what's hashtag one dad mean? And the, you know, the dad was, well, what are you talking about? And the woman who works for me was thinking, hashtag one dad. And she went over and showed him this coffee mug that said number one dad. And she was, you know, what is hashtag one dad? That is so funny. And so, you know, this like language evolves and there's this interesting evolution. And it doesn't mean that daughter's not thinking deeply about anything. You know, she is, she's asking an insightful question about it. Uh, let me, uh, we, we're almost out of time. We're very disappointed we didn't have more time, and I'm sure you all are as well. But I, I solicited some questions from my Twitter followers, and of course, they're highly intelligent and, and engaged, Dick. <laughs> so here are some of the questions. Um, one person asked, Devon Snyder, ever want to expand to 160 characters or go lower to 100? Exactly why? only 140 characters. Well, the 140 started as a, as a, a technological constraint, frankly, between uh, interoperability of text messages between uh, mobile operators. So there was a 160 character constraint on interoperability between text messages of a number of mobile carriers. We took 15 characters for the username because we wanted to be able to tell you who the tweet was from. Uh, we reserved five characters for, we'll figure out what this is for later, we might want it, so we'll reserve five more characters. And that left 140 characters for the tweet. So would you ever change it's, it? It's, that's a, I think that's fair to say that the 140 characters is probably sacrosanct. The, the Mark Chu says, where do you want Twitter to be in 10 years? I don't, you know, people, I, I think of this, I have the same answer to this personally that I have for the company. When people would ask me personally in interviews, where do you see yourself in five years? I never had any good answer to that question because I just don't think about things that way. We have a sort of a point on the horizon that we want to get to as a company in the next, you know, 18 to 24 months in, the, in, in service to being this global town square. But all the other things will, something magical will surface as we march down that path, and it will probably, you know, alter our course a little bit. And that's great. And I don't think in terms of, well, we want it to be this giant thing or, look, we want it to look this way, because those things never come true, I think, for yourself or, or, or for the company. How, how do you see Twitter and news kind of working together in the future, since this is what I do for a living? I mean, we talked about sort of programs like the time, Super Bowl. We're getting more time. They're adding seconds to the Are clock. they? No. Oh, I think am I going to get it? I'm error. probably going to get tasered by one of these people in a few minutes. But, um, you know, how, how do you see our industries working together? That would be kind of together? cool if we got tasered, don't you think? That, that would definitely go viral. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here's, here's how I see... Um, Here's the interesting, interesting thing about news. It, for a while, the um, technical advances in, um, in media distribution were all in service to, to, I can get this information out there, I can distribute news uh, faster and farther than you know, my competitor or than that other uh, medium can. Uh, but now here we are in this world war, where Everybody has access to global instantaneous distribution. In fact, anybody in Fukushima, Japan could take a picture of the tsunami that was coming, tweet it out, and it went global immediately. So I think the interesting thing for news organizations is to start to understand that as hundreds of millions of people are 
producing content and publishing content, here's what's happening right now, here's what I'm seeing. And in fact, we have a half a billion tweets a day pour into the system now, where it took three years and two months for the first billion tweets to be sent, it now takes two days. So as that happens, it's probably the case that it's more and more important for news organizations to be really in the business of what they were in initially as journalists, curating, analyzing, synthesizing, and editorializing what's happening instead of worrying about trying to be first. And, and additionally, it's also so the trusted case that, brands are going to stay right. trusted. I, I think that's right because look, when the guy in you know Poughkeepsie, New York, says, "I just heard this on the police scanner and it's wrong," he the, the cost of failure for him in broadcasting that is not nearly as great as the cost of failure of, of a trusted news source saying, "We just heard this on the police scanner." Right. So it's important for the trusted sources to be in the business of synthesizing and analyzing the data as it comes in and reporting on that, as opposed to worrying about we have to be first. It doesn't really matter to be first anymore, well, because so everybody much, else gets so the information much, right away anyway. And there's so much self-correction going on online and on Twitter that I think people are, are, are much more skeptical about information because they're having to wait to see how it all fleshes out, don't well, you but, think? Well, but well, but so I'll, I'll take issue with that a little bit because it's always been the case that in the aftermath of chaotic events, there's some sort of right. you know misinformation that's out they there. They call it the fog of war. Well, yeah. So I mean, remember in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombings, for a while there was a we were looking for this many people and they're they they're of this ethnicity and they're in this kind of car, all which proved to be completely false. Right. Uh, so. The beauty of having hundreds of millions of people on this platform... And also after the marathon bombing, by the way. Yeah, that's correct. The beauty of having hundreds of millions of people on this platform is that it can self-correct now so much more quickly. I remember in the, during the London riots the, the other year, there was somebody somebody put out a tweet that was there's a you know the the tubes the king's cross tube station is on fire you know it's being looted and someone sent out another response like 30 seconds later with a photo attached to the tweet saying that's not true at all i'm there right now and here's what it looks like so i think the more people that flood to the platform the more quickly these things self correct and finally so before i get killed by kitty uh, at katie Couric wants to know how can you help me get to 1 million followers <laughs> <laughs> well, at Katie Couric, that's a great question. Uh, well, I'll follow you immediately once we get off stage. I'll make and sure how many I start. Followers do and you everybody have? else should start as how well. How many do you have? I have uh, slightly more than you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for not but hurting I, my but feelings. I, but I cheated. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Dick Costello. Hasta luego.